Tonight on Primetime, cases that seem impossible to crack, crimes that seem impossible to solve. That's why there's Primetime Crime. Tonight, human cargo, American teenagers kidnapped. He came up behind us and he grabbed us by the hair. Girls forced to work the streets. I had to sleep with men for like money and stuff. Forced to work the truck stops. Not able to escape, not able to leave. And she'll serve as truck driver after truck driver after truck driver. I felt like I was there forever and ever and it was never going to end. You just want to, like, you know, die. Everybody sees a white Lincoln, possibly two white females in the vehicle. Good evening, I'm Cynthia McFadden. You've passed them dozens of times, probably without a second thought. Truck stops like this one, lit up by neon. But tonight, you're going to see them in a whole new light, part of a shadowy criminal network that traffics in the sale of underage American girls for sex. The hellish journey of the two girls you'll meet tonight took them to a place much like this, but began innocently, a few steps from home. Home is Toledo, Ohio, a typical Midwestern city crisscrossed by interstates. Highways that carry not just cargo, but something far more valuable and vulnerable. Kimberly lives in Toledo. She's a 15-year-old high school freshman. Her best friend is her 14-year-old cousin. We'll call her Carol. The girls grew up together and often went to a local fast food restaurant after school for milkshakes called Frosties. <laughs> it's a 15-minute walk from home. They came home from school, their chores were done. Stephanie is Kimberly's mother. Dinner was going to be probably about another hour and a half, two hours, so yeah, go ahead, go it's not that far. As you're walking, I mean, are you saying, oh, it would be great to cause some mischief tonight, or any of that kind of stuff? No, I just wanted some Frosties, man. <laughs> I'm like, oh, dude, I, want... I just was in the mood for Frosties really bad. It was a spring afternoon in 2005. Showers likely by morning low 50. It was just getting dark because it was raining, so the sun was black by rain clouds, so it was a lot darker than it would have been if it wasn't. Then a white Lincoln pulled up beside of us. In the passenger seat, a man Kimberly thought was the father of one of her classmates. And he said that his name was Mike. At the wheel, an attractive woman she didn't recognize, but she looked harmless. And they're like, hey, how are you? And stuff. And they offered us right up to Wendy's. All of a sudden, all those warnings they'd heard so many times before flew out the window. I mean, my mom's told me a million times, you know, don't get into the car with strangers, but I thought I knew the guy, so but it was... And stupid. it was raining, and Wendy's was just down the street, and so I stupidly get in, <laughs> and um, they pass up Wendy's, and they're like, well, we're going to go get you some Chinese food. And I'm like, okay, I started getting like... There would be no Chinese food, no milkshakes. The cousins were taken against their will to this house and held prisoner. So we get to the house, and he locks the door and puts on the alarm and says, you're not going anywhere. What do you do? I didn't cry because I didn't want my cousin to see me because she was just so emotionally unstable. All the time she just walked around like, what's going to happen next? You know, she didn't know if they were going to go off or what. So she's 14, and you're 15, and you feel like you have to be the strong one. Yeah. I had to. Terrified, the girls are separated by two women who call themselves Envy and Cashmere. Envy takes me downstairs, and Cashmere takes my cousin upstairs. She explained to me, you know, what I had to do, like, that I had to sleep with men for, like, money and stuff. How did she say it to you? She just came out and said it. She's like, she was so comfortable with it. She's just like, yeah, you know, you had to sleep with men for money. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Does she use the word prostitute? 
yeah, she's like, you'll be a prostitute for daddy, what she called him, and she's like, and you have to call him daddy, you know, so. Daddy? You can't even look at his picture. No, This was just the first of many nights of terror. Kimberly and Carol, just a few miles from home, were about to enter a terrifying world. Just two of thousands of American teens every year forced into sexual slavery. There are children throughout the United States that are being sold as prostitutes. Our guide to this shadowy world is Mike Beaver, an FBI special agent who's been tracking this growing problem for more than five years. How young are these kids? It's not uncommon to see 12 and 13 year olds out. What we've learned is if you have adult prostitution in an area, there's probably child prostitution occurring as well. Kimberly and Carol had fallen victim to an extensive, loosely organized network of predators. They will take the child and remove them from what they know because they can control them more closely. It means changing their identities. They obtain fake IDs. They will dye the hair of the children. All these are formal business practices that they use to isolate and keep the kids from being detected. All that was happening to the cousins inside this regular looking house in a residential neighborhood of Toledo. Until then, Kimberly was a typical teenager who worried about her grades and loved to write poetry. But now she was a prisoner, about to be sold for sex. I didn't know what would happen if they would, like, grab a knife to shut me up or something and stab me. I didn't know or what these people... Or... Yeah, I didn't know what these people were about, you know, so I had to see what they were capable of. They waited until their three captors, Envy, Kashmir, and Daddy, the pimp who also goes by the street name Machiavelli had fallen asleep. We didn't have shoes on, we didn't have coats on, we didn't have anything. We just wanted to get out of there and try to find wherever we were. He came up behind us and he grabbed us by the hair. It's like, and he dragged me and her into the dining room and he threw me into the glass dining room table. He started dragging my cousin upstairs. She was screaming, she screamed my name. And um, then all of a sudden I seen her falling down the stairs. He pushed her down the stairs. He and pushed you down a flight of stairs? Yeah. And she busted her lip open right here and she had bruises on her arm and stuff. She was crying and stuff and her lip was bleeding and everything. Really bad. It looked like escape wasn't going to be possible. They said, if you do anything wrong, we're going to hurt your cousin. And that really hit home. It's like a mind game because she's my best friend. And so I didn't want to do anything wrong because I didn't want her hurt. Did they threaten your family as well? They said that um, if you leave, we know where you live. Back at home, as day turned to night, their parents are growing frantic. It's just getting later and later. Nine o'clock, I started really getting worried, you know, because it's dark now. It's raining pretty hard. Kimberly's mother, Stephanie, and Carol's father, David, are brother and sister. Now panicked, they called local police. They came by and they said that they would keep an eye out for them. The police were dismissive, telling that the girls had probably run away and that most of the time teenagers come home after a few days. Stephanie didn't buy it. She could hardly even stay the night at a friend's house. She don't, she, that took her forever to do because she just gets homesick. I mean, I didn't have anything with me, you know, like, it was obvious that I didn't run away. We didn't even have our purses. We just were planning on going down there and carrying a bunch of frosties back. I didn't even have my cow with me. <laughs> oh, Mosers. She has a favorite stuffed animal. Oh, yes. Yeah, she doesn't go any place without Mosers. She so sleeps with him every night. When you saw that Mosers was still at home, did that make you think? She would have ran away. Moosers would have went, yeah. So a girl who still has a stuffed animal that she takes around <laughs> is forced to have sex with strangers for money. Two 
teenage cousins, Kimberly and Carol, have vanished off the streets of Toledo and have now been missing for 48 hours. I'm thinking at this point, like, something's happened. Police think the girls, ages 14 and 15, have probably run away and will most likely come home soon. But Kimberly's mother, Stephanie, refuses to just sit and wait and starts to search on her own. I'm calling people. I'm going to other police stations and other sides of town and dropping off photos and just everything I could. Are you, you know? getting increasingly frantic? Oh, yes. I was getting very, very nervous. All the while, the girls are being held captive across town in a house less than six miles away by a pimp and two prostitutes. Kimberly, not her real name, is wearing a wig as a disguise. But she's agreed to tell us her story, a terrifying tale of how indoctrination quickly ends her innocence. Did you actually get new names, names that you were supposed to refer to yourself as? My cousin was Ambrosia, a type of flower or something, and mine was Heavenly. Yeah, and you'd have to introduce yourself, but they, hi, I'm Heavenly, you know, and then have a little saying, um, like, because I'm heavenly to be with her, I don't know. And it's like, I had to say that, and I was like, oh my God, I just felt so gross. <laughs> They know their kidnapper is Daddy. He also goes by the name Machiavelli, after the legendary master of manipulation. What they don't know is his real name, Derek Willoughby. He has a long rap sheet for drugs and violent crime, including the alleged kidnapping and sexual assault of a minor that was never prosecuted. Did they provide clothes for you? Derek went out and he got, like, skirts, like, what he likes to call shirts. They were like, Nothing. <laughs> and um, Very provocative clothing. Yes, yes. How long are you a captive before you have to sleep with someone for money? It was the next day that um, all four of us went to a hotel. And um, the guy was going to pick one of us, and he picked me. Oral sex? Yeah. Vaginal sex? This is a sort of tender question, and you don't have to answer it, Kimberly, but were you sexually experienced before all of this? One time, that's all. I only did it one time. With a boyfriend? Uh, yes, yes. So you weren't exactly a woman of the world? No, I wasn't at all. It hurt, you know? Like, it hurt every single time. But I couldn't say nothing. I couldn't say, ow, you know, because they're not thinking, you know, these prostitutes, you know, they do it all the time. The cousins are never left unguarded. Someone is present even when they are forced to have sex. And they never let you alone with the customers? Oh, no, no. They were watching. I mean, it was so uncomfortable. Would they stay in the room and watch? Yeah. And sometimes the older prostitutes would even join in. And you had to do stuff with other with the girls too. Oh, yeah, I had to do something with Envy. It was that was so disgusting. <laughs> that was like the worst part, really. In fact, it's common for adult prostitutes to supervise what's known as a seasoning period for young victims. Somebody is always walking her to the next date and walking her back. She comes back and she's locked in the apartment with other girls. University of Toledo sociologist Celia Williamson studies the sexual exploitation of teenagers. We've increased community awareness. And started a program to help rescue victims. So the reason that a girl who, let's just say, was snatched mm -hmm. doesn't just run to the first police officer, the first person mm -hmm. that she sees and says, you know, I'm, I'm being held yes. against my will. It's because that pimp says to her, I will hurt your family, I'll hurt your siblings, you better not say anything to anybody. Until she can find a way to escape, make eye contact, tell someone during the seasoning period, she's not going to get away. A 15-year-old high school freshman, not even old enough to drive, is now being schooled as a teen prostitute. So they're giving you the Sex 101 class. Yeah, they're just telling me what to do and what not to do and like they can't touch you 
without paying more. They can't, and no kissing on the lips, no hickeys, you know. And they said that, you know, just act like you're liking it. You know, and I'm like, well, that's going to be hard, you know. I'm, I didn't want to do any of this. I wanted to just knock them out and run. <laughs> Among the hard lessons of Machiavelli's forced boot camp, how to evade police. Like we had to do this obstacle course in the backyard with like cones. And um, we'd have to go under the swing set and hop over the fence. And my, when I did it, my face went like this and just whammed up against the fence. So, so did you do it in high heels for no, practice? No, but we had to wear those around the house. Had you ever walked in shoes like that before? Oh no. By day, the girls are held in separate rooms in the house. At night, they're taken to work at this strip of Toledo motels. Their forced labor earns up to $500 a trip for Machiavelli. Did any of the Johns ask you how old you were? No. No. They didn't care? No, they didn't care. They didn't care if I was 12. You know, they just wanted something. And what was sick is that, like, one of them, my first time, he had a wedding ring on. And I'm like, oh my God, I mean, that's just wrong, you know? I mean, you got a wife at home, you don't need to be doing that. Did you think you were gonna make it out of there? Honestly, I probably gave up hope like the fifth day. I'm like, like I swear like 10 times in one hour, I told my cousin that, um, don't worry, we'll make it out. You had to have hope for the two of you. Just two of what's believed to be thousands of victims. What is your guess about how widespread this is based upon the research that you've done? Well, there has been estimates of a couple of thousand children in this country to over 100,000 children in this country. The FBI thinks it's the bigger number, 100,000 minors in America forced to trade sex for money right this minute, enough to fill the largest football stadium. And it's not a coincidence it happens in cities like Toledo. Look to those highways. These crisscrossing interstates can quickly carry a vulnerable teenager far from home. Toledo is a hot spot for recruitment and training, and then the girls are shipped out to coastal cities and larger cities to work. When we use the term sexual slavery, you literally mean that young girls are being bought and sold. Absolutely. We have girls in Toledo taken off the street and forced into prostitution, taken to another city and forced to work the streets and having no money, not able to make phone calls, not able to escape, not able to leave. And that's exactly what's happening to Kimberly and Carol. After seven days of captivity, a regular client, a truck driver, is recruited to drive the girls, along with Kashmir and Envy, out of state to a fresh set of customers, Machiavelli following close behind. While back home, a mother and father wonder if they will ever again see their daughters. Police know that after 48 hours, the chance of a safe return dwindles by the minute. Now you're into the second week. Do you start to think that maybe she's not coming home? Yeah, that's when you drive down by the, by the river. Two teenage cousins kidnapped in Ohio are in an 18-wheeler rumbling towards the Michigan state line. Forced over the past week to have sex with multiple strangers. They have been missing for nine days. It felt like years that I was there. It felt like, you know, I was there forever and ever and it was never going to end. The truck driver is 46-year-old Richard Gordon. His payment for the trip, sex with 15-year-old Kimberly. While her cousin and the prostitute called Kashmir go to another truck. And I had to do something with uh, Richard. And, um... I didn't like that because truck driving is The truck stops are unique in how they're used to market children. They're isolated. They're out of the public view. They're traditionally out of law enforcement view. Where are you, Dave, Kevin? 
Each girl can net their pimp more than a thousand dollars a night. These pimps operate across the United States and what they do is they network with each other. They will call each other and say the money is good today in New York and then pimps will go to that area as it heats up with law enforcement or the money is saturated then another pimp will call them to Florida. So part of the battle against the trafficking of teens for sex is taking place along the nation's highways. We visited a truck stop in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. We're going to go to the Gables first. Where local law enforcement is mounting a sting. When Heather is out there, we're going to try to allude to Heather being young. Police decoys like Heather are given fake names. Tonight, she'll call herself Cookie. She's wired and sent out. I'd head up to the very first row. Walking a lot and seeing if we can pick up any guys, if they're interested in any, you know, soliciting a, a prostitute. And... We have a woman, come on! Cookie scans on the CB radio for a driver seeking sex. Hey, Cookie! Yeah? Where are you at? What do you look like? I'm five, five and a half, 34B, brown hair. Want anything else? But the drivers this night are wary. Now are you? You looking to party? I'm 16. Well, how much do you charge for me? Uh, 25. 25 for what? For whatever you want. Sex, whatever I want. Sex, yeah. This driver takes a path. But the guy that she was talking to is in row four. But finally, Cookie makes a deal. Sex for money. If you guys going that way, we'll go around this way. Jeff got him. Right now you're under arrest for criminal solicitation to commit prostitution. The arrest is made, and the cargo, a truckload of shampoo and detergent, is seized. Have a seat in there. I'm trying to keep the company from no one. That's unlikely. Police call the trucking company and ask if they want to bail out not the driver, but the truck's valuable contents. Because in his case, the decoy did not claim to be underage, the driver faces only a misdemeanor charge and a $425 fine. But he still may have some explaining to do to his wife. What do you think she'll say? Well, she'd probably be pissed out. Back at that truck stop in Michigan, it's one in the morning. Kimberly and Carol are still separated and scared. But they're now supposed to have sex with the truckers lined up along what's called Party Row. Where you look at? And all the prostitutes operate on their own channel. So Blossom may operate on channel 12. Orgasm may operate on channel 6. Where you at, baby? We'd be channel 18 and they'd be channel 11. And so, like, um, they switch over to here, say, yeah, this is where we are and stuff. Then she will ask him, what does your house look like? House meaning the semi that he's in. And he'll say, I'm in the red house down towards the end. And you will see the prostitute get out, and she will go down, and she'll serve as truck driver after truck driver after truck driver. For Kimberly, it's almost too much to take. You just want to break down and cry. You just want to, like, you know, die. But then one driver notices some very young-looking girls and, disgusted, calls police. 911. Could this be the break police finally need to rescue these two young and terrified cousins? Stay with us. In a truck stop off Michigan's busy Interstate 94, a truck driver notices what appears to be two underage prostitutes at work. Instead of driving on, he calls 911. They've just recently gotten into a white semi truck with a trailer. Our call came around 3 in the morning. Soon, Sheriff Daniel Minzi's officers are on the scene. It's not uncommon. Um, we've had them here before. Uh, they come up from the Toledo area. Police approach the truck where Kimberly and the older prostitute guarding her, Kashmir, are holed up. She tried to hide me a little bit, and then um, they found 
her, and then I kind of like stuck my leg out, like, and then they're like, you too, and I'm like, yes, I'm like, oh no, and I went out. Two of them had identification, the truck driver and one of the females who was an adult. The other one who didn't have identification gave a false identity, false name, and date of birth. Kimberly lies to the police because she's terrified about what her pimp lurking nearby might do to her or her cousin if she tells the truth. And remember, he's drilled her to give false information. They're not going to tell you they're juveniles. They're going to give you fake names. I mean, you try to put yourself in the situation and say, I'm desperate, I want to get out. The first thing I would do is say, you know, I'm really 14. Help me. They know the consequences, and they are scared to death. And I was just, you know, looked like I was scared, like I was terrified. I kept on fidgeting and stuff, like, I didn't really look at them or anything. I'm like... You know, like, kind of like, this help, you know. Once police are able to get Kimberly alone, they realize something is terribly wrong. So then um, they're like, well, you're free to go home. They said that to Kashmir, and they kept me. Once they had left, she told us that she was much younger and gave us her real name, which we ran uh, through the computer and found out that she was missing out of Toledo, Ohio. Kimberly had been rescued. Police rushed her to the nearest hospital, but all she could think about was her 14-year-old cousin, Carol, who was still a captive and being held in a separate truck. Like, oh God, you know, what's happening to her? You know, I don't know anything. I was just crying. I was just hysterical. For the first time, I was able to cry. And for the first time in nearly 10 days, Kimberly's mother finds out her daughter is still alive. It was the best day. <laughs> what did they say? That uh, the girls had been kidnapped and being held against their will and that they have been forced uh, into prostitution. While her mother and Carol's father, David, make the 90-minute drive to Michigan, Kimberly is treated at the hospital. I took a whole lot of pills, you know, to make sure I wasn't, if I got pregnant, you know, it's gone. If um, I had any sexually transmitted diseases, it'd be wiped out before then. Then my, my mom came in and she's like, she started crying. She's like, I'm so sorry that happened and stuff. Oh, I remember walking into that hospital room. Oh my God. <laughs> it was both happy and miserable. I was ecstatic. I have my daughter and she's in one piece. Where's my niece? In fact, her niece Carol is still being held by the pimp who has fled the truck stop and who police believe is heading back to his home base in Ohio. Officers rush to alert Toledo police. Anybody sees a white Lincoln with a black male driver and possibly two uh, white females in the vehicle. The driver's name is probably going to be uh, Derek Machiavelli. Meanwhile, Stephanie and David race back to Toledo with Kimberly in the back seat, frantic to find Carol. But how? Kimberly remembers the name of the street where they were held, the only brick house on the block. They find it with Carol's sneakers outside, and Carol's father calls 911. Yeah, my daughter's been kidnapped. I found the guy's house. Their cars are home. It's Downing, D-O-W-N-I-N-G? Downing. And this is the person who took your daughter? This is his address? Yeah. For 40 agonizing minutes, they sit in the car waiting. Still, no police. Now, Kimberly's mother calls 911. Oh, yes, um, we called off about a kidnapping. Uh, let me check it. Okay. Okay, I do see the call in. It's in, but we haven't had a crew yet to go because we've been pretty backed up. Okay. Um, my niece is in the house. Um, I know the guy has been abusive to the kids uh, sexually and physically. I'll let the dispatcher know that you're checking uh, on the ETA, but like I said, we've just been pretty backed up right now. And the police said, you know, it's a low priority. We can't send anyone out right now. And once my uncle heard that, he went into his truck, he got a crowbar, and he just <sighs> right to the house. And I grabbed the phone, chasing me after my brother, and I called the police again on my way up to the house, saying, this is serious. Yeah, I'm one. I'm one. We need the police here now. We, we're going in. We're getting my niece. My brother is banging on the door. 
Give me my daughter. Give me my daughter. What was about to happen would be the strangest twist of all when primetime crime continues. You're hearing the frantic screams of an aunt. She's been waiting for police to come rescue her 14-year-old niece, who's now crying from help from inside this house. But an hour and a half after the first 911 call, police are still nowhere in sight. Ma'am, where are you? And I hung up the phone and I told my brother, I said, get in that house. She's screaming for us. With Kimberly in the back seat, Carol's father grabs a crowbar from his car and breaks the front window of the house. He went running upstairs and I went running behind him and he tackled the guy and my brother was beating him with, with the pipe. And I didn't see my niece, and the window was open. They threw her out the window, out of the second story bedroom window. Who threw her out the window? Dick. They just threw her out. And um, my uncle started you know, fighting with Derek, and my mom started fighting with, um, with one of the girls. It's a fight across the street now. There's a guy beating up the guy on the grass. Then, a neighbor calls police. Oh, my God, she's hitting him with a rock or something. The guy's sitting on him, and then the other people are beating him. Derek had blood on his face, and he was holding my uncle down. And um, the two girls were, like, pounding big old rocks into his head and stuff. These people are beating this man. They've been with rocks. His head's all bleeding, and there's no police here yet. In addition to the family's calls, there will be a total of three more calls to police by neighbors. But still, no one comes to help. And then I saw my cousin way over there, and I'm like, I'm like, come here, come here, come here. And um, she starts running there, and she gets in the back seat. And then we were in the car for about five minutes, and then finally the ambulance arrives. In fact, after seven 911 calls, the ambulance and ABC's affiliate WTVG are on the scene before any member of the Toledo Police Department. The man spotted his daughter in the house and started to try to break into the house to recover his daughter. The father on that individual day probably did what any father would do. We asked Toledo Police Chief Mike Navarre why in the world it took so long for police to respond. We answer about a thousand calls for service every day. And uh, sometimes we get there within seconds, sometimes it takes several minutes. In fact, it took 93 minutes. Finally, police take everybody to headquarters and question the prostitutes who say the girls were there voluntarily. Yeah. Nobody forced I mean, her to go up. She was excited and happy and all that shit. I mean, she wasn't acting scared. And there was nobody held them against her? No, and at, them girls knew that if they wanted to leave, that they could leave. Did you have to watch the girls in the house or anything? We're not holding you here. We're not holding you here. There goes the door. If you ever want to leave, leave. Police also question pimp Derek Willoughby, who at first claims to be a clothing salesman. That's what I'm doing, selling the clothes. Well, I said anything else. No, that's it. Nothing else? Nothing else. So who are these two girls? Brandy and Jennifer. They're friends of mine. But after an hour... All right, so let's stop, let's stop playing games. All right? We're going to stop. I know who Casimir is. I know who NV is, okay? I know what you do. You're probably going to end up getting charged with kidnapping, two counts of kidnapping, okay? Two counts of compelling prostitution. You got two white girls and you got two white girl minors, 14 years old, 15 years old, and then you got the feds in your because they they throwing in the border, taking them across state lines, and then they talking white slavery, and you talking a long time in jail. You might have thought so, but that's not what happens. Willoughby and the two prostitutes are released on bail. With her kidnappers again free to roam the streets, Kimberly feels frightened, in danger, and abandoned. For the longest time, I was really depressed, and all I wanted to do was, like, you know, kill myself. But, like, I couldn't, you know, if I left, my cousin just be, like, you know, out there and have to face this all alone. And it's not the last time they'll see their tormentors. 
Will Kimberly and Carol ever again feel safe? Stay with us. In the months after being kidnapped and forced into sexual slavery, Kimberly and Carol endured a kind of agonizing limbo. Their captors free to roam the streets of Toledo. 14-year-old Carol even ran into them at the local mall. Her and Envy, like, face to face, like, me and you, face to face, and they're like, this, look at each other, and they both turn around and start walking away. So she goes out in the car and she calls me up, and she told me, I'm like, what, and stuff, and I'm panicking, because I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God. And um, I'm like, lock the door, lock the door, and get down. But seven months after the girls were snatched off the street, a federal grand jury finally indicts Derek Willoughby and the three other adults on multiple charges. The two men and two women transported the minors from Toledo to a Michigan truck stop where they were sold as sex slaves and beaten up. The prosecution was part of a nationwide FBI roundup of sex traffickers in which 31 people were charged. More than 30 child victims were identified. Nine of them, including Kimberly and Carol, were from Toledo. Authorities say that Toledo is one of the hubs for teen prostitution, and yet it seems nobody in Toledo knows it. No, no. I had no idea anything like that was happening in Toledo. I was very shocked. It was a big surprise to me. Big surprise to everybody I know. Now, with her captors in federal custody, Carol feels able to talk to us. I was really scared because I never imagined that would happen to me. But she's still frightened enough that she asks to wear a wig as a disguise. I'm doing a lot better now that I'm in counseling for it and everything. Um, but I have them nights where I just think about it and break down and cry. We asked her if there was anything she wanted to say to the man who kidnapped her. God, there's so many things I want to tell him. I hate what he did to me and my cousin, what he did to my dad. And he thinks he, he can call himself a man. A man would not do that. A man would not take two young teenagers from their loving home and do that to them. I don't want to see tears anymore. For Kimberly, the hurt still lies just below the surface. And I don't see how they can think that they didn't do anything wrong. No, I mean, hitting us and verbally, mentally, and emotionally abusing us, taking away everything, our childhood, you know. When you say you've lost your childhood, is it another way of saying you've lost your innocence and your trust? And Oh yeah, I, have, I lost a lot of trust in people, you know. I just think that everybody's out to get me now. It's, it's been very rough. I always tell her how how proud I am of her, how brave she was. Both of them, both of them were very brave. So are you nervous about today? A little bit. <laughs> A little bit. This is finally going to be over. We were there the day Kim and her mother got ready to take the long ride back to Michigan to testify against her captors, the people who forced her into committing a series of degrading sexual acts. It will be the first time in nearly two years she has seen them. I'm going to be scared, anxious, nervous, happy also that they're finally going to get what they deserve. Well, not fully, but okay. <laughs> you ready? You're not going to let them win. No, they can't because then they're just going to get away with it. I mean, if they go free, that's just injustice. Outside court with her mother and her uncle, who's still recuperating from his beating, Kimberly reads us some of what she will tell the judge. I wish that they get the most time in jail, like I was in jail from them. They hurt me and my cousin physically, emotionally, and mentally. They don't need a chance to do this to any other girls. Finally, oh my yes. Pimp Derek Willoughby pled guilty to trafficking minors across state lines for prostitution and was sentenced to eight years in federal prison. The prostitutes, Brandy Shope, known as Envy, and Jennifer Husky, called Cashmere, are sentenced to six and a half years in prison. And truck driver Richard Gordon gets five years. You're still scared. I don't want them to get out because if they, if they get out, I don't know, like, I don't know if they'll find me. I mean, they found me once, you know. 
I mean, I know there's going to be some nights where I'm just going to be thinking about it, but I'm moving on with my life slowly but surely. <laughs> The quiver in her lip tells how hard it is. I mean, you feel like crap. You feel like you lose your self-respect. How do you get it back? Hopefully doing this today, you know, letting other girls know, watch out. So hopefully I help somebody. And I told my story so that people can watch out for themselves. And the federal government is also watching out for girls like Kimberly and Carol. Just a few weeks ago, an FBI sting operation cracked down on prostitution rings in 16 cities and rescued 21 children from this 21st century slavery. To find out more about the government's Innocence Lost initiative and how you can keep your kids safe, go to our website at abcnews.com. Hope you'll join me later after your local news for Nightline. I'm Cynthia McFadden from all of us at Primetime. ABC News. Good night.